I'm going to talk about uh, techniques for improving uh, coronal alignment in adults' uh, spinal deformity. Uh, we heard a lot about not fusing and disc arthroplasty, so some of uh, the surgeons in the audience may just want to take a deep breath, because um, you're going to see some fusion here. <laughs> some disclosures. I don't think any of them is relevant to the talk here. Um, I want to acknowledge Dr. Lenke because uh, some of the slides are taken from him. Uh, some of the techniques uh, that I'm going to go over, uh, I've learned from him. Um, so that's why I wanted to put that up there. And so my approach uh, for treating uh, patients who have spinal deformity uh, is a stepwise type of approach. I'm going to focus obviously more on coronal deformity here. Uh, we've heard a lot about sagittal deformity over the past decade or so, but it seems like in the adult population, uh, we have stopped talking a lot about coronal deformity. So I thought it would be a nice thing to come back to it and, 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 uh, and talk about this as well, that this exists and it's important. Um, and so the way I look at it is, is step one, uh, I group patients into three categories. Uh, type one is sagittal only, uh, the second type is only coronal deformity, and the third is a combined sagittal and coronal deformity. Um, before we go on to how to treat these patients, you have to be able to quantify the, uh, the deformity and then measure it. And so really the best way to do it is, is with the use of full body imaging. Uh, at the very least, people who do deformity surgery should have a visualization of the, of the body from the um, auditory meatus to the femoral heads. But ideally, you really need uh, these type of imaging. Uh, I think I clicked too fast here. Well, I'm going the wrong direction. All right, we're going back. There you go. Um, and so, yeah, ideally you need these uh, full body type of imaging to really get an idea of what's going on in the patient's body. And so here's a patient who has, who is uh, balanced in the coronal plane, but as you can see, obviously metaline in the sagittal. Type 2, like I talked about, she, this patient is well balanced in the sagittal, uh, but clearly uh, metaline in the coronal plane. And then the third type, which is combined, which is not as uncommon as we think. Uh, especially in the older age group. And so this patient has deformity in both planes, uh, severely disabled. Uh, another thing I want to uh, emphasize, again, coming back to the use of these full body imaging, is that it also allows us to look at compensation. Because oftentimes we just look at the scoliosis imaging and we don't look at the legs. And we, we underestimate and underappreciate the amount of compensation the patient is also trying to put in to really in, to, uh, to, to make up for the deformity. And so if you look at this picture, this patient is really flexing their knees uh, in the sagittal plane to be able to stand up straight and still can't. But also in the coronal plane, which we don't pay attention to, the, the, the knees, uh, especially that left knee, uh, is in a varus position to try to compensate, make up for the coronal malalignment the patient has. Uh, in addition to trying to uh, tilt their pelvis over. And so again, like this full body imaging really, images really allows you to to figure out what the deformity is and, and what kind of compensation the patient is putting into there. The next step, once you know what the deformity is, how bad it is, is to figure out well, how flexible uh, is, is the deformity. And so we routinely use, uh, in addition to standing, we also use uh, supine x-rays. And so this uh, picture should give you a good idea of how useful those can be. If you, uh, on the one side, the patient is standing, uh, has horrible thoracolumbar kyphosis, but on the other side, as they lie down, uh, the deformity almost completely corrects, and so it's extremely flexible. Uh, this is a patient of mine, again, uh, severe coronal imbalance when, they lie down, when, when they're standing, um, and as they lie down, there's a significant improvement, not perfectly aligned, but significant improvement in that alignment in the coronal plane as well. So supine uh, imaging has become a standard uh, for us in, uh, in assessing deformity pre-op, because it really gives a good idea of how flexible the patient is going to be. Uh, and a CT scan obviously is really important, gives you, uh, allows you to assess whether the patients have uh, prior anterior fusions, uh, either iatrogenic or uh, just idiopathic uh, for different reasons. And it also allows you to look for pseudoarthrosis, which you can utilize to then get correction at those regions. And obviously pedicles uh, to see how, what kind of fixation you can get. Um, and then the third point I want to emphasize, uh, again, pre-op planning is to assess the lumbosacral junction, uh, which again, uh, 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 many people don't pay attention to when, when thinking about the coronal plane. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to it in terms of the sagittal plane, uh, but the coronal plane got forgotten a little bit. And so this is a, um, not published, uh, but classification that we've started to use more and more, 
um, uh, again with Dr. Lenke. Um, the, the curve types are similar to the, uh, to the adolescent idiopathic scoliosis uh, classification, but uh, what I want to really bring everyone's attention to is this, is the lumbosacral modifier uh, that's been added on. And so the way we look at it is that we have the patients obviously standing uh, x-rays and then also supine x-rays. And if on the supine as well, the lumbosacral coronal curve, Cobb angle is still more than 20, uh, then most of the patients uh, tend to have more of a structural lumbosacral curve that is stiff. Uh, and our tendency in that case is also to address that. And so to, to uh, prove or to show that point a little bit, here's a patient with adult idiopathic scoliosis. Um, um, the curves are 60 and 80 degrees, and when they lie down, uh, that lumbosacral curve measures about 10 degrees. So in this situation, we didn't think that uh, the lumbosacral curve needs to be addressed. And so this patient uh, got really nice coronal uh, alignment uh, without doing anything at the, lumbo, uh, at the lumbosacral junction. And as you can see clinically as well, uh, looks well balanced. On the other hand, you have this, uh, this patient uh, where you can clearly, you can kind of get an idea uh, of the fact that the lumbosacral junction uh, has a much bigger deformity than the previous case. And so let me just click a few forward. Even on supine imaging, the lumbosacral curve measures about 38 degrees. And this 3D uh, picture of the lumbosacral region shows you uh, how collapsed uh, the curve, lumbosacral curve is on that side, and you have those big ostiphytes um, uh, making that curve stiff as well. And so in this patient, um, we, uh, I'll show you the extras later, but we chose to uh, include the lumbosacral curve uh, within the construct because if you don't include it, um, you can end up uh, worsening the deformity to the other side. All right. Uh, once you have an idea of what the deformity is, how flexible it is, and you looked at the lumbosacral junction, now you're thinking about, well, how do we fix that? And so I'm not going to go into osteotomies uh, uh, because uh, we've kind of heard about uh, some of the posterior correction techniques, and we will hear about it a bit more. <clears throat> but I'll go over some examples of how things are utilized. So this is a patient of mine um, who uh, has a combined coronal and sagittal malalignment, uh, as you can see. Um, uh, on the supine film, she does, this is the kind of picture I showed before, she does correct but not 100%. And considering the deformity was quite flexible, uh, I actually did not do any osteotomies in these patients. It was all just, as soon as we laid her down on the table, uh, it was quite flexible. Um, and so she, uh, with just small uh, uh, facetectomies, we were able to get perfect alignment on this patient. Uh, she had other soft tissue problems and a whole lot of autoimmune diseases which made her prone to get this deformity. Uh, but that just shows you that the extent of deformity, is, it's really important to assess the flexibility, especially on supine films. Uh, this is another patient, uh, just your regular uh, adult idiopathic scoliosis, uh, no problems at the lumbosacral junction. Uh, again, did not need any osteotomies, has good, uh, well-balanced spine in the coronal and sagittal planes. This patient, on the other hand, um, real um, stiff deformity in the coronal plane, uh, and then even on supine films, there is no change. Uh, she's still imbalanced uh, in the supine, uh, uh, on the supine films. And so this is the type of patient where if things are not moving and the patient on the CT scan uh, also had fusion throughout their, through the discs in the thoracic spine, this is the type of patient that's going to end up with the three-column osteotomy to balance them, uh, because here, posterior column osteotomy is not going to work. And so you can see how uh, with the three-column osteotomy here, everything is balanced in coronal and the sagittal planes. And so uh, the next few slides are just going to talk about, and hopefully I'll just breeze through this quickly, uh, about the correction sequence that, that we use uh, to correct uh, patients that we are going to fix to the pelvis. And the, the main concept here is that we are paying attention to how we fix the coronal deformity, but the rods are placed uh, in, in, in an order that will fix at the same time the sagittal deformity. And so we start off with the lumbosacral region. So in this patient, uh, the uh, convexity of the lumbosacral region is on the right side, and we want to achieve lordosis at the lumbosacral region. Uh, so we know we're going to compress there, and so we start off by placing the rod on the right side at the lumbosacral, fix that uh, segment, the lumbosacral segment, Next step, once you're done with the lumbosacral area, is to move on to the left side and fix uh, the rest of the lumbar curve. Because again, you're going to compress across the, across the uh, con convexity on that side. And so that's where the left rod comes in. And kind of moving forward, then the, then the left rod also helps 
uh, to cantilever the curve over uh, towards the right. And then again, in addition to com uh, compression uh, over, the, uh, over that segment to get lordosis and balance the spine coronally. And then finally, continue on the same left side uh, to get the thoracic kyphosis and fix the coronal imbalance. And then you come back to the, to the right side to, um, to, uh, to, to uh, compress on that side uh, as well because the sagittal plane now at this point is already locked. Now it's fine tuning uh, um, as far as the coronal plane is concerned. And so I'm just gonna skip through some of these steps to kind of show how this ends up looking like. Um, and so the, the, co the goal really is to build up a, a, co a construct from the bottom up. And, and the sagittal, prof sagittal profile is addressed at the same time as the coronal uh, alignment. Um, and the final thing is, once you're done doing all these rods and screws and everything like that, uh, you want to see what, what, what the patient looks like intra-op before you let them leave and then you have to come back if there's a problem. So uh, it's, it's, for us it's essential we get uh, long uh, uh, films of the patient intra-op to assess their uh, alignment overall. And, and for patients who still have some malalignment, that's where the kickstand comes in and Dr. Uh, Forgetting the name, our cowboy doctor here, Sorry. Jay, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Johnson. Sorry, um, you talked about the kickstand a little bit, but in a different way. So this, we use the same concept of the kickstand on a bicycle uh, that you somewhat alluded, alluded to, but in a different way. Uh, and the goal here is really to to use that kickstand to kick the patient over to the other side uh, and and align their align their. Um, uh, coronal balance. And so this is kind of the vector of, of what that rod looks like. And this is the final uh, picture of how it goes. I'm going to skip over, this is a video, I'm not going to go through it uh, for the interest of time, but that extra screw that's placed in the pelvis that you can see uh, on, on, the right, on the right side of the patient uh, is, is, is a different type of an iliac screw with a different vector uh, that allows us to distract um, the whole construct to the contralateral side. Mm -hmm. 